I would even argue providentially, the two languages that scripture is written in, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, both have a single word for this idea of both justice and righteousness. Welcome to 242, a podcast of the Buffalo Vineyard Church where we discuss topics that are important to our lives as students of the way of King Jesus. This is season two, episode two. I'm discussing our value for justice ministry with Mark Harley. We define justice and define justice ministry, talk a little bit about what we can learn from scripture and from Jesus about justice ministry and some of the the challenges to pursuing pursuing justice in the world, partnering with God to set things right in the world, and some of the ways that we've attempted to do that in and through our church. I hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, Steve, <clears throat> we're talking about justice today. Yeah. The light, is, light topic. Right, yes. And small topic. Small topic. Yeah, we'll be done in what, like 15, 20 minutes? <laughs> if we can keep this to not a six hour podcast, we'll be okay. Wow, you couldn't cover it all in six hours, so <laughs> we might as well not cover it all in one hour and then that's right. be good. That's right. Um, yeah, so this is this is part of our um, va- vineyard value series, right? Like we're, we're going through this process of talking about who we are who are we as the Buffalo Vineyard? Who are we as the Vineyard? Who are we as God's people, right? So do you want to just um, do a little, I don't know, like a quick synopsis of, of what this sort of series project is, right, that we're, that we're talking about, just as a reminder? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you just said it, but um, walking through the eight values, the eight identified values of our church as a way of, um, yeah, just highlighting the things that we think are important to God um, for us. And, you know, again, as we've said before, I think talking about justice, obviously that's not unique. That's not a unique value of the Buffalo Vineyard Church. That's a value of the church. It's a value for even, you know, once it's a value for all human beings, right? Not just Christians. So, but yeah, being able to just kind of talk about things that are shaping and defining who we are as a community. That's right. Um, And so today we're talking about justice. Yes, we are. And the... You know, when this podcast actually comes out, it'll be Martin Luther King Jr. Day, mm-hmm. right? Which so is tomorrow. it's tomorrow. So we'll have, um, I mean, what a better time to talk about justice, right? And we're, we're kind of planning that out intentionally and all of that too. But yep. um, there's a couple of quotes that we wanted to start this conversation with that I think to get the conversation going, right? To get the wheels turning. Yeah. Um, do you want to read the first one? Yeah, yeah. He says, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's kind of like, I feel like that starts to get at, um, you know, one thing that we should try to do is define what justice is, Mm -hmm. right? Which is not easy to do, but I feel like that, that starts to sound like a definition of justice. Yeah. In some way. Well, I think the, (laughs) like, so in a sense, he's, he's essentially saying, you know, like, you'll know it when justice has arrived. Like, you'll be satisfied when justice shows up. Just, like, you will fail to be satisfied until it shows up. Like, you'll know when it's absent, too, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that that, for me, gets at a definition of justice. I don't remember who I first heard say that, but it just really clicked with me that the simplest way of defining justice is when things are the way they're supposed to be. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that helps because we all have, and when I say we all, like all human beings have built in us an innate sense of this is the way things are supposed to be. And this is the way things are not supposed to be. And, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, I think it's actually in mere Christianity, CS Lewis uses that as an argument for really for the existence of God. And we're probably as, as Christians all familiar with the, um, kind of like the problem of theodicy is the technical term for it, right? It's like if we live in a universe that was made by a good, all-powerful God, well, then why does injustice exist, right? That question, which is a a real conundrum that as Christians we have to to struggle with and wrestle with. But C.S. Lewis says, well, but you also have to flip that on its head. Given the fact that we live in a universe full of pain and suffering and death, why is it that every single one of us has this pervasive, uh, like unrelenting sense within us that there is a way that things ought to be? Mm. 
right? Yeah. And as much as the, the problem of pain is something that is a legitimate philosophical problem for us who believe in a God to wrestle with, it, he, you know, C.S. Lewis says that this was one of the things that helped lead him to faith in Christ. And so it should be an encouragement to us that there is actually a witness in all human beings for, you know, what you could call like good, yeah, justice, things to be a way in which they currently aren't. And I think that's, that's a part of what, um, mm. you know, Martin Luther King is pointing at that there's like, no, no of course we're not going to be satisfied. Like, <laughs> no, we're not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness, like a mighty stream, like until we actually experience the world as it's supposed to be, why would we be satisfied with anything else? Mm. So, yeah, like in a way the, <clears throat> and this is, I think it's, we, is it fair to say that our world is not how it ought to be? I think it's fair to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I don't know that I've ever, I mean, I can't even, I can't even imagine somebody who would argue the opposite. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so I, I love that idea from CS Lewis that it's like our, our disappointment or our dissatisfaction that is actually um, like evidence, right. Evidence of God's existence or evidence of, um, of like true justice. And it's like, it's, and it's, we're like, stuck in its absence, right? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's really powerful. I think that begs the question though. Of, so if we're not satisfied now, right? Mm -hmm. And we're waiting for justice, we're for things to be made right, yep. right? And that's kind of how, in our previous conversation, you um, tried to get at this sort of like, or you, you proposed a very simple definition for the kingdom of God, right? Where things are as they ought to be. But things are as God, God, wants, as God them wants them to be, them to be right? right. And so, I mean, the idea of justice and the idea of God's kingdom are, as Christians, we would say those are very tightly interwoven, for sure. So I think that begs the question of like, you know, what do we do in the interim? Right. <laughs> right. So like, are we just waiting around or um, it's like, well, now what? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I, I mean, that's this is actually where you would think that all Christians everywhere would be on board with the idea of justice ministry. Actually it's, that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. There are churches or congregations or, you know, streams of, of Christian faith that would essentially say, yeah, that's not really our job. Yeah. And, you know, our job is to have right doctrine and convince other people to have right doctrine and wait. Mm -hmm. um, and, as much as that sounds like a caricature, and I mean, it is a caricature of some Christians, but it's not a caricature of all Christians. There are Christians out there who ha who teach that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for us, our, the, the specific value that we're talking about today is not just justice, but it's justice ministry. And so it's not just the idea that there is justice out there that exists, but actually more specifically as a church, we value in the language that we've put down on paper, partnering with God to set things right. Right. And that's justice ministry. And so your question was, you know, we live in this dissatisfaction with an unjust world, knowing that God will someday in the future set all things right. And what are we to do in the meantime? Just wait and sit with the disappointment? Well, the answer is no. Actually, we are called to justice ministry. We're called to partner with God to set things right here and now. Yeah. And I think there's a there's a tension between what we experience in the present and what we can expect to experience in the present and what we labor for in the present and what we know will come in the future. Right. And so there is a difference between the justice that we are partnering with God to, to enact now mm -hmm. and the justice that God will enact in the future. Those aren't the same thing. Um, but we are called to do that work now to partner with God to set things right. And that that's a anywhere where something is not right is a place where God wants to partner with us to set things right. And so yeah. whether that's in a marriage or a family or in a school or in something as large as, you know, global economic structures or like whatever you want to point at, if you're like, oh, well, there's something that isn't the way that it's supposed to be. God actually is inviting us to partner with him to set things right. Mm. Yeah. And so that, that starts to get at um, this sort of second chunk of like a, of a quote from Martin Luther King that okay. we were going to bring up 
um, it's there's this uh, there's the letter from Birmingham jail, right? That mm-hmm. that was written in 1963. And um, yeah, can I, I'll, I'll just yeah, read it. You to have you. the longer chunk, mm-hmm. right? I've got yeah. the longer chunk. It's really, really interesting. Do you want to give the, oh, no, he's got the context in there. Yeah, he does. Yeah, cool. Yep. So yes, yeah, so this is from, from Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, 1963. <clears throat> it says this, uh, I received a letter this morning from a white brother in Texas, which said, all Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually. But is it possible that you are in too great of a religious hurry? It has taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. And then this is where Martin Luther King um, sort of responds to that. It says, all that is said here grows out of a tragic misconception of time. It is the strangely irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. I'm coming to feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. We must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. So crazy because it's, uh, I mean, you're, you're kind of talking about this earlier where, you know, there's this, um, you know, tendency for, I mean, just from what I know, like some, some churches and church communities in America to not feel like justice, like acts of justice and works of justice are their responsibility. It's just like teach good doctrine and, you know, like we'll just hang on and wait. Yeah. Right. Um, and like we hear this and this is from, you know, 1963 and it sounds pretty contemporary even today. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but what I really love about, about this is, uh, that idea of, um, where he says it's right at the end, it says it comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of men willing to be coworkers with God. Yeah. Right. That's kind of what you're talking about. It's like, we, we're not going to always get it right, but we, we can try. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like we're, we can participate in this thing. And it's that like participation that um, I think is really important. What I wanted to sort of talk to you more about. Yeah. Well, so there's a lot of directions we could go out of that quote, but that's um, that's a worthy place to start. Is yeah. the idea of being invited to participate with God, and yeah. that I don't think we can underestimate how incredible that is. Yeah. Because. On the surface of it, that's a really dumb idea on God's part, right? <laughs> like, I think we have to really actually yes. come to terms with that. And the 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 story that I always share to highlight this is, um, uh, you probably heard me tell this story a few times, but so my son Zane was probably two-ish, um, wasn't older than three, um, so two or three years old. And we had a windstorm that blew a panel of our fence down and knocked over one of the posts, like broke it at ground level, mm-hmm. right? So I had to go out and like actually dig out the the concrete chunk at the base, right? So I couldn't pull it out using yeah. the post because the post had broken off. So I had to dig out the the concrete chunk and then, mm-hmm. you know, pour a new hole, get buy a new post and then reattach the, the, um, the panels. And yeah. so all of that, that was probably, that would be like maybe, I don't know, like a two hour job. Yeah. Well, so my two-year-old son, Zane, is like, Dad, I'm going to help you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, this is horrible. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah, right? But, but I had the presence of mind. Or pro- probably I didn't. Probably my wife is like, you're going to let him help you. It's probably what actually happened is my <laughs> wife told me to be a good dad. Um, I don't remember. But, but what I do remember is like I let him help me, mm. and I had the presence of mind to actually engage with him as a dad instead of as a boss trying to get work done. You know what I mean? And, yeah. Um, and he literally helped me by spending four hours standing in the hole I was trying to dig, right? Like it was, <laughs> it was incredibly unproductive and inefficient. It was like the worst way to get the job done, right? <laughs> if the job was fixing the fence. Right. But if the job was training my son or bonding with my son, then it was actually incredibly, mm. you know, incredibly effective. So anyway, I yeah. always tell that story to highlight this this point that like, God doesn't need us to fix problems in the world. And yet he chooses to include us anyway. And that's not really because he needs our help. You know what I mean? But it is because 
of the kind of people he wants us to be and the process that he knows we need to go through to actually become those kinds of people. And so, you know, that like you keying in on that phrase, the, the, the tireless efforts and persistent work of men and women willing to be coworkers with God. Um, yeah, it's like that, that there are things that get developed in us when we do that, that can only get developed in us when we do that. And they're the kinds of things that, bear fruit that will last forever, yeah, literally forever. So yeah, it's, it's like that, that call to partner with God to accomplish his purposes in the world of setting things right, of making things the way he wants them to be. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost as if, um, I mean, even your illustration made me think of, <clears throat> it's almost, it's almost as if it's not really about the world at all. It's like about us. It's about, you know, it's, I don't know about our, who we are too. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Right. It's, it's like, about all of it. Cause it's really easy to sit back and go, the world is so messed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, ugh. but then, but then we're, if, if you, cause we're trying to separate ourselves from that. Yeah. And we can't do that with God. No. And we're kind of dumb when we try to. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm guilty of that, of going like, can you believe that this happened? I can't believe that this is happening. Right. And wanting to somehow absolve myself of any sort of connection to it. or That's not really how God works. No. But I think, so, right. A lot of times we, I think we just don't take, like there, there are statements in scripture that, I don't know. I feel like sometimes we just don't really like we gloss over them or we don't really come to terms with. Mm. And so the, like one of the ones that I'm thinking of off the top of my head is just like scripture says that God is reconciling all things to himself through Christ. Right. And we're like, Oh, it's probably like just me. Just the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like just me <laughs> really like that's how we'll read that. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah. like, and that's like this, this kind of, so I think there's something I'm, I'm about to make fun of evangelicals again, which, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> that's where we were at last week. We're it's back there. I know it is low hanging fruit. Again, like I said last week, I do number myself among the people I'm about to lampoon. We can make fun of ourselves. Right. But so, but the beauty of the evangelical tradition is the emphasis on the individual, right? There's a, there's a key insight there that is incredibly important, right? That God loves individual people, right? And he, 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 he doesn't, he leaves the 99 for the one, you know what I mean? Like that. And that, and that we should have that same kind of dedication to individuals and to seeing people come to a personal saving relationship with Christ. Right. So that that's this key foundational fundamental evangelical insight that is right. Um, but then we will take a, a, a biblical passage like God is reconciling all things to himself. And we're like, Oh, isn't it cool that God is reconciling me? It's like, no, it's not what the passage says. It literally says all things like, right. you know, black holes on the other side of the universe and you know, all of the plants and animals and, you know, and all of the people everywhere throughout all of human history. And that does include me, but it's like, we lose all of that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. You get, you got me on a roll there. I, I don't like even that. remember how you started. Why do you think that, that is though? How do you think that happens? Well, we don't need an excuse to think we're the center of the universe. Sure. Do you think that that's always been a struggle or do you think that that's a new struggle? Mm, that's a good question. I think it's actually a new struggle. By new, I think, um, well, I, I'd like, I, I think that, my, and this is where I'm, I'm like such an amateur historian, but well, my this understanding is an amateur of podcast, right? Yeah. We're going to put that disclaimer. This is an amateur <laughs> podcast. We promise that none of the things said on this podcast are expert opinions. I, we welcome amateur yeah. and amateurs. <laughs> so my understanding of history is that, you know, the, the first of all, the idea of like the value of the individual, it, it is something that actually comes out of the Christian faith, right? Yeah. And you can see it spread throughout history. And, and there are other faith traditions and other cultural traditions that don't actually share that value for the individual, right? Yeah. Um, so it has an origin in history and has grown throughout time. Um, that's so, so that, and then also when you look at just the, you know, like most people don't really 
know this about history, but uh, I think in the year, it's like 1890, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I'm, I, my stats, you'd have to, all right, <laughs> fact check my stats, guys. <laughs> but I think in the year 1890, so this would be like 130 years ago, 95% of um, people in America were living below the extreme poverty line, right, in, in today's dollars. Um, so, so it's like accounted for, for inflation basically. And so like basically what that stat means, the reason I would point at that is that you go back basically a hundred, 150 years and they're, they're like, nobody had anything. Everybody was starving to death all the time. You know what I mean? Like, sure. like you go back into history and it's so bleak, you know what I mean? And we, we don't really have a grid for that because we live in this time of, of, and, and in a country of such wealth and abundance. And he, I mean, obviously we still have poverty and problems in our country. And so that blinds us to the fact that, you know, we, we really are just so rich and we have so much, um, you know, like we, like people in America don't starve to death. Like that doesn't happen. You know what I mean? Whereas like throughout much of human history, lots of like a good chunk of society just starved to death every winter. You know what I mean? So like we were, I guess all that to say my understanding of human history as like an amateur historian is that if you go back too far, basically everybody knew that like the King was the real person and the rest of us just like kind of served his needs. And I think you had, you had more of like that kind of, I don't know, mentality. Whereas I think today we, we do have a lot more of the like, Oh no, no, no. Like, I deserve my 15 minutes of fame and I deserve my, like, I do think that's a new idea. I don't, I, again, I could be totally wrong. I'm just, mm. but it, that is my understanding of the moment that we live in, in the West is that we really do live in a unique period in history, which for better and for worse is the product of like this deep valuing of the individual. And there's a lot of like, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's one of the things about, you know, the country and the culture we live in that we should be able to hold up and say, yeah, this is actually something that comes out of a valuing for people in the way that God values them. But there's a flip side to that. And when it's disconnected from the truths of scripture or the truth of the gospel, because there's more than just one truth, right? It's not just that God loves you as an individual. There's a lot of other true things about God and about you and about the world that all have to be held together in, in balance and intention with each other. Couldn't you make the argument that what we see with, you know, and just to speak about American culture in, in, in the last 120, 130 years, that what we've seen in America is the, the, like what you're talking about. So like, which is so focused on the individual, right? So we, we see maybe justice for individual people in American society and that that's why I mean, we're in some, in some sense, we're in a bit of a reckoning with that right now, right. right? In the last two, three, four, five plus years where, you know, there's a huge percentage of our, of our culture that's saying like, yeah, this isn't working for me. Right. You know, and I think there's definitely an argument to be made that it's kind of an illustration of what you're talking about where justice is not limited to individual justice. Right. Right. right and right, so right. For like sure. we're, we've seen, I think in America, we've seen that like coming out. Um, where we've seen that that's not actually what's been happening, that some people have been, um, I don't know. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe like as a whole, I, I know what you're, you're arguing that as a whole, like people, you know, people aren't starving to death in America at the same rate that they were 130 plus years ago. But there are still people suffering. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right. So yeah. it's like. Things have improved drastically. What do we do with that? That doesn't mean that they're great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's there's just a lot of people still suffering, even in our neighborhood. Right. Right. It's like, how do we how do we do that? Um, but I think where, so this is where, like that valuing of the individual, it'll, it's, so it has alleviated some suffering. Right. But I think when it's, when it's disconnected from, again, like the act, what, like when, when the branch is cut off the tree and it's not connected to the other values of the kingdom, yeah. um, then 
it, it can, it can actually begin to cause problems of its own. Like I would say rampant individualism is itself a cause of a lot of suffering in the West. Yeah. Right. And so that's where like, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't look at our, our culture and go, Oh, that's a Christian culture. I think there's Christianity in our culture and there, you know, it's got an influence on our culture, but we have a culture that has like, we've, we basically bastardized a lot of Christian values and virtues. And so some of them like a value for the individual have taken on a life of their own in ways that aren't always positive. Yeah. So, but there's also still plenty of other problems just inherent in human existence that don't even have anything to do with that. You know, again, there's lots of reasons why people suffer and you were pointing out, you know, that our, like I would look at our country, um, and our day and age and say, oh, wow, like we've made a lot of progress in alleviating some forms of human suffering, but there's others that we haven't even really begun to touch. And there's some that there's some new forms of suffering that we've created that are unique to our age. So, I mean, in one sense, I don't even know if we're like net positive. Yeah, You know, right. I don't even know how you go about measuring that. Maybe it would be better to live 150 years ago and deal with starvation, mm-hmm. you know? I, I have no idea. Like I've never had to deal with that. So I don't, I like maybe somebody who's actually lived through starvation would say, you don't know what you're talking about. Like deal with, you know, deal with being stressed out by the internet. Like that's fine. <laughs> I don't know, but, but you get my point, right? Like, yeah, I, I do. and like, I don't think that there's any way to really judge from our perspective. <clears throat> it's like, it's God's position to judge. And, but yeah, there's, there, there's plenty of things wrong with our society. But I think that one of the things that we have gotten right is that value for the individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has led to a different perspective. But it's in some sense that value for the individual has gone unchecked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For right. Sure. And so oh, it's yeah. like we've forgotten about everyone else. And mm-hmm. I think that's that. I mean, that articulates a lot of what we're in the middle of right now. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes, for sure. I mean, I think that, so it's like, I don't want to turn this into a different conversation, um, but I think there's a lot of misunderstanding from my perspective, you know, again, Steve, the amateur philosopher, amateur cultural (laughs) critic, critic, amateur, you know, armchair politician, whatever. But I, I see lots of critiques of American society around like some of the social justice issues where it's like, oh, well, you know, this group of people doesn't like that group of people or this group of people doesn't care about that group of people. And I actually think it's in some ways better and worse than that. I think it's more that no group of people cares about anybody Mm. because nobody cares about anybody other than themselves. Like that's, and that's both like, that's good news because that means that for the most part, there aren't like shady groups of individuals plotting to get you. (laughs) But that also means that like nobody really cares about you. And so that's both like, and again, this is Steve, the, the amateur observer, but I think that that's more what's going on is that we have this rampant individualism in our culture that is, um, not good, Mm. not good, but it does grow out of, I think a deeply biblical idea that in every individual is made in the image of God and is deserves to be treated as such Mm. so in some way what you're saying is that you know justice if we're going to sort of zoom back out a little bit to that Mm -hmm. idea just that broad idea of justice is that it's something that is both personal and universal right that it's about individuals but it's also about the collective of i mean of humanity but also of like i mean if you're if we're saying that and if scripture tells us that, that God is, um, you know, restoring all things, it means that we're talking about our environment and all these things, right? Our world creation. Right. And so let me read this passage. This is, yeah. um, yeah, you, cause you, you, I, I, I pulled it up like whatever, 15 minutes ago and I Sorry. didn't know if I get back to it. No, no, no. Hour. Well, we were, we moved pa- in the time it took me to look it up. We moved past it. So this is from Colossians one, but I'm, I'm reading from the message um, translation, not because it's better, but I just, I like his, some of his wording in, in this specific passage. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, he says, we look at the sun and we see God who cannot be seen. We look at the sun and we see God's original purpose and everything created for everything, 
absolutely everything above and below visible and invisible rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and he holds it all together right up until this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end for beginning to end. He's there towering far above everything and everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death and his blood that poured down from the cross. So it's that. It's like there is literally not a thing anywhere, anytime that God isn't saying that belongs to me and I'm putting every piece in its right place and its right relationship to each other and its right relationship to me, right? Mm -hmm. All of it. And so, yeah, it is about individuals and groups and society and history and economics and it's like all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we actually, I feel like, you know, in some of the Old Testament narratives, we get a sense of that. Right. Like, um, I mean, even in some of the, like the Levitical laws, things like that. (laughs) Right. Like if you wanted to, to, I mean, we could nerd out about that for a little bit of time, but, um, I mean, you get a sense of, of God trying to establish a community of people, right. That is living just individual lives within a just community of economics and geography. Yeah. Everything. Right. Like, that whole, all of those laws sort of articulate that, right? right? This sort of comprehensive sense of the right way to like live in creation, right? That obviously is hard for us to do. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think that that gets at, so we were talking a little bit about, like when you're talking about justice, well, so when you talk about ju- justice in today's climate, m- most people are going to start thinking about or talking about racial justice, right? Yeah. That's kind of the moment that we're in. Sure. Um, and that certainly is a justice conversation that we ought to be having. Um, but there's lots of places to think about and talk about justice. And even just, you know, to, to the points that you've been, been making over the last 15 minutes or so, there's like justice at kind of like this individual level, but there's also, you know, kind of groups or corporate level, there's structures of justice and injustice that are at work in our world. And we should be thinking about and analyzing all of those. And again, you bring up Leviticus. Well, Leviticus is, it, it, it establishes rules for governing individual behavior. And it also establishes rules for governing group behavior. And it establishes like it actually sets up certain institutions within society. Right. And it's, and so again, like as believers, we should be thinking about all of that through the lens of how ought this to be, right? How ought Steve to act? How ought Steve to treat Mark? How ought Steve to interact with whatever food, you know, money, but then also like, okay, so what about like, our economic system, how ought that to be set up? What about our educational system? How ought that to work? You know, and like at all of those levels, you can start asking questions of justice, right? And so, you know, that 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 idea of like systemic justice or systemic injustice is, you know, why I guess I've heard that defined almost in two different and competing ways, but both of them are helpful. One is like setting up rules that treat different people differently. Right. Yeah. So it's like we've actually codified what. So historically, that would be like racist laws. Right. Where it's like, oh, well, we're going to treat, you know, people of African descent this way, people of European descent this way. Right. And it's built into the laws. Right. So that's one way of thinking about like systemic racism or systemic injustice. Where it's like, oh, you actually built a system that treats people differently. But then there's also a very different way. And this is probably the more contemporary way of defining systemic injustice, which is you've built a system that on paper, like doesn't reference different groups and kind of like, at least on paper is treating them the same, but built somehow built into the system, like you're getting different results. Right. And, um, so like maybe even there's no evil intent, right? Maybe there's nobody anywhere who's saying this is the way we're going to, you know, hurt these people or help these people in unjustly, but there's still like problems built into that. Right. And I mean, 
you could think of lots of examples of both the like former, former kind of systemic injustice where it's like, Oh, like we just went about building institutions that were like helping one group at the expense of another. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of examples of that, both in American history and world history. I mean, if you go back far enough, that would have been considered the right way to do things. Right. It's like, well, of course we're going to help our people out and hurt your people. Like that's, that's how we do things. But as, as a world, actually, we've moved away from that idea, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but we still, and I don't know how we'll ever get away from that second kind of systemic injustice, um, where it's like, we can do the best we can to create the best institutions that, that serve the needs of all. And there's still going to be oftentimes these like unintended consequences that come out of, you know, people doing their best attempt to do the right thing and yet it doesn't work. I mean, mm. like an example of that would be, you know, one of the biggest problems that has, um, one of the forces that has caused some, some of the biggest problems in our, our city's history would, would be suburbanization, right? And seeing, you know, a huge chunk of our city's population leave the city out for the suburbs, right? Yeah. So over the course of, I think, if I get my stats right, for, it was this is actually from the time of the um, the closing of the um, Erie Canal and the St. Lawrence Seaway, which I think it was like 1956, something like that, right? Mid, mid, mid-1950s, um, which basically is kind of like the point at which like Buffalo lost its priority as like a kind of like a point of shipping, right? Because we yeah. closed down. So, so that's why that's a key metric. And um, from then until like maybe 1990, something like that, there was a slow shift. So like the, the population of Erie County stayed the same, but the population of Buffalo c- cut in half and the population of the suburbs doubled. Right. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody left the city, went to the suburbs. Some of them probably moved to other places or whatever, but, yeah. but essentially you saw from 600,000 people in the city of Buffalo, 300,000 of them left and ended up in the suburbs. And then you had this hole in, in Buffalo, right? Now there's a lot of other reasons why Buffalo has had problems and has suffered historically. That's not the only one, but that's an example of something that, that contributed mightily to some of Buffalo's problems over the last, you know, few generations. And while I'm sure some of that migration was for negative reasons, right? I'm sure that you can point at some sinful reasons sure. behind it. There's also a lot of people who are just like, man, I need to work if I want to feed my kids and that's where the job's at. And you can't fault somebody for doing their best to feed their family, right? And so that's an example of somebody just trying to do the right thing and contributing to the destruction of a city, right? And so that's this example of, you know, I mean, in the, in the language of scripture, it's like there are powers and principalities at work behind like human systems, like polluting it and perverting it. And I think that is something that we should be partnering with God to set right. But it's also one of those things that ultimately we're waiting for God to come and solve too. You know what I mean? And that doesn't mean we should ignore it, but I don't know how we solve that one. You know, I don't know how we like, I think we can work to solve specific instances of, of, of that kind of systemic injustice. And we ought to, like, we ought to say, oh, wow, turns out like this didn't work and we should fix it. But then every time we try to fix a problem, we might end up creating more problems in the process. And that's, that's Mm -hmm. like baked into living in a fallen world. Again, still, we should still be doing our best attempt to address that, but I don't know how we fix that completely. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, that i mean specifically thinking about you know that time in buffalo's history which and and it wasn't just buffalo it's all these major cities right which i mean as often referred to as like white flight right right and i I think one thing that relates to sort of the earlier sort of um point we were talking about with individualism is what that and not everyone was leaving the cities at the time like like what you're saying like a lot of people were leaving to get to go to work or whatever but um it's seems like when individuals pursue their own comfort it causes destruction i think i would say when individuals pursue well it's it's like so many other good things when it's pursued as a sole end right comfort's a good thing yeah right 
when comfort is pursued as an end unto itself, it becomes an idol and it absolutely becomes destructive and not just destructive of the person seeking it, but also of everybody else around them. It's really scary to think about it, leaving this wake, this almost like generational wake of destruction. I mean, it goes back to the beginning. Yeah. That's the, I, so a generational wake of destruction would be a good way of, that would be a good contemporary way of defining the doctrine of original sin. Yeah, yikes. <laughs> you just got it. You just nailed it. <laughs> mm. And then I think also, just to respond to what you said um, a couple of minutes ago too, is that idea that you know we're, we can work hard to make institutions that are just on paper, right? That are like objectively just but at the end of the and there and yet for some reason they're not working right like i think we're we're having a reckoning like that in our society right, right. now where it's like why is this not working for everyone and i mean i think to be frank it's just because it's a human system right like are we are human i think it begs the question of like are human beings on their own capable of creating just systems and infrastructure <laughs> Right. I might go out on a limb and say no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Right. Um, that's kind of the, the participation piece, right? Well, like, we should not just, creating... on that happy note, let's end our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's a wrap. Mark just killed it. <laughs> no, Mark I think just I, popped the balloon. I agree. And I think I, I said something similar earlier. I, I would agree. It's not, that's not an optimistic take. But I think it's an honest assessment that we we ought to, as Christians, feel compelled to work to build the best institutions we can in our society, whether, you know, whatever level we're talking about, like within our household, within our congregation, within our neighborhood, within our city, within our state, within our nation, within our world. Like we should do that. But also we should be realistic about the fact that we're probably not capable of building something that not only isn't perfect, but might not actually end up being worse than the thing we're trying to replace. Yeah. Like we should be open to that, that our best attempts could be disastrously wrong. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't be working to make things better. Yeah. But. So in, in preparing for this conversation, um, you were talking about some of the, the ancient uh, language for justice, right? For oh like, yeah. Right. So like the translate. Like, Sedek and Diakosune. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. I mean, so this would be where it would be great. So aren't you like studying Greek and Hebrew in seminary? Not yet. I, oh, I will okay. be. All right. So, I so we'll, re yet. we'll revisit this conversation in two years and Mark <laughs> will be teaching me things because I'm, I'm not a language scholar at all. Oh. I mean, I read, read commentaries and, um, but that's, that's the extent of yeah. what I know. So I, I can't geek out too hard on this. We'll geek topic, out together at one day when I, <laughs> when I get to those courses. I'll just listen to you geek out. Um, <laughs> But I mean, and this is where like the study of language is really helpful because, you know, the, the document that is our founding document as, as, or the documents, um, it, are the, the various books of scripture and they're written in languages other than English. And so when you actually learn those languages and engage with them, you, there's a lot of rich meaning. And this is an example of that, that, you know, the, the language, um, that we use around like kind of being right on the inside, we tend to use the language of righteousness, right? Um, and uh, there's like a body of words that are associated with that that we would use to talk about being a good person, right? Yeah. And then the the kind of the word that we would use for like society being ordered the right way or put together in the right way is the word justice. And there's kind of a whole body of words connected to justice that we would use when we think about, you know, again, things being rightly ordered in our economics or our system of law or whatever. Mm. And the, the word dikasune is the Greek word that actually means both of those things, right? Yeah. So we, we tend to divide those up, but in, in the Greek, which is the language of the new Testament, they're not divided. They're one thing. I love that. Right. It's, I mean, it's a fantastic insight, right? And then fascinatingly enough, and I would, I would even argue providentially the two languages that scripture is written in both in the old Testament and in the new Testament, both have a single word for this idea of both justice and righteousness. So that's in Hebrew, that's Sedek. And, and it's, again, it encomp encompasses both of those ideas. And, you know, so, so it's, 
it's, it points at this reality that there is a connection between individual human beings being rightly ordered on the inside and society being rightly ordered. And that, you know, again, I think that that is, it's an observable reality that societies that are justly ordered are so because people who are rightly ordered on the inside haven't made it so. Yeah. And it's also true that people like, if you're a good person, it's because you were formed that way, yeah. right? And so it's also the opposite is true, that justly ordered societies produce righteous individuals. Yeah. And so it's this cyclical nature, which again goes back to, you know, what was the phrase you used to, to capture the idea of original sin? This like generational wake, wake. of destruction, right? Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, when one of those things gets wrong, it has profound downstream effects that end up like, Produce like spiraling into destructive societies that destroy individuals that produce more destructive societies. And that's this, that is the story of human history, but also God is at work in the same way, producing righteousness in individuals and justice in societies. And so that also too has a generational wake, right? And that's, I mean, as Christians, we're hopefully living in the right trajectory on that one. Yeah. I mean, I think that is, I agree with you that that's just a really helpful insight for the moment that we're in right now, right? Where we see in America, we see people with very different opinions on the just just the just justice in our society. Yeah. Right. And it's people saying on one side of the equation saying there's no justice. Like I'm suffering generations, generations before me have suffered. Right. Right. And then on the other side of that argument is a group of people saying like, I'm I'm not an evil person. Right. I didn't do it. Right? I'm a righteous person. Yeah, don't look at me. So they're having two different conversations. Yes, they are. Where if we look at this, you know, biblically and historically, those two things right. are actually linked. Completely. And right. You would be able to actually have a conversation and articulate those things. Yeah. Whereas now we can't. Right. Well, and I think that's where, you know, I and I'm tempted to get hyperbolic about the polarization and breakdown of conversation in society. But then I'm always reminded that like, you know, this isn't the most turbulent times even in our nation's history, much less in world history. But, but we, I mean, for my lifetime, these are the most polarized times that I've ever experienced. And it's disappointing because on, on so many, like, you know, we're talking about justice. We haven't really dug into politics too much, but Mm -hmm. uh, clearly there's like an intersection between talking about justice and talking about politics. Um, and I find on so many, not every issue, but on so many issues, the right and the left are both horribly and tragically wrong because the truth is not somewhere in between, but rather in the combining of the perspectives of both, right? It's not that the truth is in the middle. I, I mean, like what you're pointing at, like, is it social responsibility or individual responsibility? Well, the answer is it's both. Yeah. The answer right? is yes. Yeah. It's, it's not somewhere in between. It's like the embracing of both perspectives. Right. Yeah. And if we could just get the people who are like, well, no, it's all society that forms people versus no, it's all pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Like both of those perspectives are so wrong that like, they're like juvenile perspectives. It's like, how can you be that naive to think that that's actually how the world works for both of them? Yeah. But the reality is simply that it's a, it's both of them, right? It's, it's, it's what we started off saying that it, you know, healthy individuals are formed by healthy communities, but healthy communities are shaped by healthy individuals. And it's this cyclical process of people being individually personally responsible because society shaped them that way. And then out of that individual responsibility, they also are then socially responsible and taking responsibility to shape and order society in such a way that it produces more rightly ordered individuals. It's, it's, it's that. Mm. Right. And so like, that's sort of, you know, the, that's how it ought to be. Right. That's right. how it ought to be. That's how it ought to be. So in the meantime, we get to be participants in trying to make things how they ought to be. We get to work in the mess, <laughs> right? Like we're not going to wait, right? right? We're not going to wait. We're right. not going to sit around and wait like the guy who sent Dr. King a letter, <laughs> right? I'm he, not doing that. He didn't just wait. He told him to wait. Right. We're not doing that. 
It's good. So what has um you could be you could be famous in the wrong way that way. <laughs> I'm famous for the letter I wrote to Dr. Martin Luther King. No, not me. <laughs> um what has what has this looked like in just in your life? Uh, like how has this I mean, get how more have specific you, about the this because I could go a lot of how have you stuff. wrestled with just this idea of justice within your own life and how particularly in your journey as a Christian, right? Like, yeah, pro, even before you were a pastor or even as a pastor, like, yeah. how has this like worked itself out? I'm, I'm sure you didn't just wake up one day and go like, all right, I'm ready to just like do justice now. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so I grew up in the church and in a more evangelical corner of the church. Um, although that even that's not entirely true, but that's broadly true. Yeah. And I think I inherited th- this part is true. What I inherited growing up. Um, and I have no idea. Maybe my parents would be like horrified to hear this. I'm not sure. I wonder I should ask them. You should. Um, are you horrified to find out that <laughs> this is what I learned from you? Cause I don't, cause they would have never said it this way. Um, but I grew up definitely with a like, well, I'm a good person or, well, that's not true. I didn't think I was a good person. I actually thought I was a bad person in some ways because I was a bad person in some ways. But, but with that being the metric, like, am I a good or a bad person based on like, you know, do I, am I like having sex and swearing and drinking and doing drugs and like that, you know, am I stealing from people? Am I like, like based on that metric, like I'm a good or a bad person. And that was that was it. Like that was really kind of like the way of evaluating myself. And, um, you know, the whole kind of like, well, are you like working to shape the world in a way that's just, I would have probably looked at you funny until I was at least 18. And then when I went off to college, I definitely had some, uh, and I'm abbreviating the story quite a bit, but I had some experiences with God that challenged me to actually care about people and the way society was ordered that I think really pushed me. Yeah. Like just pushed me, challenged me intellectually and morally, probably more intellectually than anything else. Cause it wasn't like I had been confronted with the idea of loving my brother and rejected it. I just hadn't really thought about that. It was like a call on my life because of the way that I, again, like the kind of the tr- Christian tradition that I was brought up in, it just hadn't presented itself to me that way. Sure. And then I think God specifically challenged me um, and I began to, I think that was even part of like that challenge from God was a seed that was part of what grew into the desire to plant a church in Buffalo. Yeah. Um, for sure. You know, cause we, I, it would have been very easy for us to plant a church across town from the Reading Vineyard and to plant another church in Reading or in Anderson nearby where I, I grew up in Anderson. Like that would have made more logical sense mm. and would have been, like we would have stayed around my family. We would have stayed around. We had really close friends in Reading. You know, these were like, like deep friendships. Um, so that would have made more sense. But I think that that desire for, I probably would have used the word justice at that time, but in the context of what we're talking about now, justice ministry, that is it. And yeah. so I think that like God, God challenging me and me, essentially saying, Oh yeah, I guess I'm, I am supposed to care about that. Aren't I like that is in scripture that is in the heart of God. I guess I need to embrace that too was something that grew into the desire, um, to plant a church in a place like Buffalo and then ultimately to plant a church in a place in, in Buffalo. Yeah. 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 So there's that. And then I would say, man, my experience of Buffalo, that's what I was going to ask how that kicked my teeth in Mm. it around this topic that kicked my teeth in talk about that what's, so, a, what's a good story to illustrate that i don't even know if there's a story and i have to think about a specific example but i think so i you know i've been around poverty and addiction and it's not like i never seen suffering or you know like i'd seen all of that stuff yeah. but um we came to Buffalo thinking, oh yeah, like we'll, we'll fix all that kind of, not quite that naive, but almost that naive. Like God is sending us to Buffalo to fix all (laughs) of these problems. And it'll take like two and a half years, three years, maybe if we're slow. Um, like that, you're not the first person to think that. Right. No, I know I'm not. Um, there's a reason why church planners are so young, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, 
It's the same reason that they um, recruit privates in the uh, army when they're 18 instead oh, of when man. they're 30. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? You want me to take that hill? Sure, I can do that. <laughs> anyway, so, oh, um, yeah, I think, and again, so I had experienced some of the, the levels of human brokenness that I've encountered in, in, in Buffalo and other places. It's not like I'd never encountered that before, but I'd never actually been to a community where that was endemic mm. in the community. You know, I'd never been to a neighborhood where like that was the cultural expectation of people is that kind of life. And where, you know, kids are raised without actually really having real examples. Like they might be able to see something on TV or have a teacher that's talking to them or whatever, but they don't really have examples of anything other than, you know, addiction and unemployment. And, and it's like, oh, wow, this is, this is not like what I thought because it's so foreign to my context, you know, like I grew up in, I mean, rural, like definitely blue collar, um, you know, not like upper middle class, but middle class, you know what I mean? Like that's how I grew up. And, yeah. um, yeah, you know, like again, plenty of problems in a community like that. And there were people with addiction problems. There were people who were poor. There were people who were, you know, being oppressed or whatever language you want to use who were suffering. You know what I mean? Like that I experienced that, but, but as a community that, that was not the expectation or the norm or, you know, it wasn't endemic. And then coming to Buffalo yeah. and seeing, you know, and try, I mean, trying to help people, you know, it's like, Oh, I want to help you. And yeah, I mean, the number of conversations I had with people, you know, where it's like, like I'm entering in out of a naive attempt, but a sincere attempt to help. And it's like, I just don't, I don't have anything to offer. Yeah. I can offer kindness. I can offer prayer. So in that sense, I don't have nothing to offer, but I don't have a solution. Mm. I don't have a solution. And, um, yeah, I mean, that definitely was the experience of the first few years in Buffalo is like, Oh wow, I got nothing. I just don't have any tools to address any of this. Mm. How did that impact you as like a, like a young pastor, a young church planter? How did that, did that shape? How might that have shaped your, even your idea of just justice in general and like our role in it, our participation in it? That's a good question. I mean, I guess it definitely gave me some appreciation for a more nuanced perspective on things. Mm -hmm. I think I gained an appreciation for that around, around a lot of these kind of like justice issues. So, I mean, even like just more broadly, like the way in which people engage in political prognostication is not the right word, but, um, um, prescription, you know, it's like, sure. Oh, well, I, I, Steve Shank from my own little corner of, you know, the smallest, you know, from my couch, I'm going to fix the world. It's like, right. no, you're not. <laughs> but like everybody in our country has a solution to all of the problems everywhere all the time. It's like, okay, I actually have no idea what I'm talking about, you know? Mm. So I think I gained some of that. And I'm, you know, I'm still arrogant enough to think I have all the world solutions, but <laughs> at least now. <laughs> I, Just you're still human enough to think that. Yeah. So I think that that's part of it. I don't know. It's probably, it's probably shaped me in ways that I don't totally understand. I mean, I think. One of the things that I would say I've leaned into a lot more, and I kind of already pointed at this, is, it's, you know, it's a phrase I haven't used as much anymore. I guess we started using the language of incarnational ministry, but the idea of a ministry of presence, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, I will be present to somebody, I will be kind, I will offer prayer. And, like, as much as that might seem like a cop-out when you're talking about, you know, fixing a broken justice system or fixing a, you know, it's like, well, wait, that you're going to solve a broken global economy by being kind and praying for people. That's not going to cut it. And it's like, well, it might actually be better than what you're trying to do. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean? But at least I know I'm not hurting anybody and I'm, I'm helping. And so I, I think that like I've leaned more into that and, um, and then also, yeah, probably like even just the value for partnership and collaboration grew out of some of that too. Now that I think about it, you know, cause I mean, as much as it's difficult to know how to solve some of these really complicated, thorny social problems, that doesn't mean they're impossible to solve or at least to, to make some improvement on. And there are people making progress, 
Right. Yeah. And so like getting, you know, you're like, Oh, Oh, there's this guy seeing patients for free over on the West side and like actually do, doing something cool in the name of Jesus. Like that. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> maybe Like, I don't know, maybe I could show up and be kind and pray about that. I don't know. You know what I mean? But like that, that definitely grew out of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's like, um, I don't know. I guess what I hear you saying is it's like being willing to respond to, I mean, just that idea of presence, you know, being able, being willing to respond to the injustice that you see yeah. and just be, I mean, maybe the natural inclination is to say, I got to get out of here. Yeah. Right. And then to instead go, no, I'm just going to like, the opposite reaction of that is kind of what you and your family did. It's like, we're going to put roots down here. No, that's kids true. Here and, that is true. You know, and I think that that's a part of the neighborhood. Yes. It, it points at, it's the thing. Well, so Jesus calls people to pick up their cross and follow him. And he models for us what it looks like by, he, he went to the cross and, but that same pattern you can see, you know, again, Martin Luther King, you can see that pattern in his life. Right. And, um, you can see it in the pattern 